Fantastic. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks to those of you that are joining us. I know some people might be watching later on Zoom or on uh, YouTube as well. So hello to everybody that's also on the YouTube channel. Glad that you're here. So by way of introduction, I know most of you that are here probably know who I am. My name is Bob Foose. I'm one of the client partners with New Leaf Training and Development. Uh, was uh, been with you for a few of these sessions here in this uh, professional development time. So excited to, I think, close out our series here with part two of Team Excellence. So let me share my screen. We can talk a little bit, little bit about where we're going. Like I said, my name is Bob and uh, New Leaf Training and Development, you see up at the top, our mission, our vision is really to help people and organizations be their best. That's what, that's what we're all about. And it's been really an honor and a privilege to partner with uh, Fresno City College and be a part of your own um, development journey. And, and hopefully this has been add, added some value to you all as well. If you want to reach out to me, you can certainly email me at bob.foos at newleaftd.com. The TD stands for Training and Development. Uh, we're also on Twitter. Our website is newleaftd.com. We offer a number of different things, right? Consulting, seminars, e-learning, coaching, and keynotes. Obviously, today is uh, a little bit of e-learning, but also really very much a, a seminar that will be going about today. So uh, by way of a learning agreement, I know it probably you probably remember this from Monday. We just encourage you to be fully present during this time. Thinking can be really rare in most organizations to get time like this that you can carve out, that you get paid for to be able to be developed personally and professionally. So would really encourage you to be fully present during this time. Maybe that means that you, you know, put your cell phone to the side, put it on vibrate or silent, or even put it face down, close other browser windows or tabs, close your office door, do whatever you need to do to be fully focused during this time. And I want to promise you that uh, today's time won't be boring. Uh, hopefully you know that already. Uh, it'll also be highly interactive. And so we do really want to have opportunities for you all to talk and share with one another. Obviously, I've got some things that I want to talk about, but I think there's a lot of wisdom here as well. Uh, we've all been a part of teams, good teams and bad teams. And we can talk about uh, our experiences and what we've learned from those experiences. So highly participatory and then also highly practical. So whether you find yourself currently on a gr in a great team experience or maybe you find yourself currently in a team experience that really isn't very satisfying, I think you're going to hopefully learn some things that will help you know uh, what you can do maybe to change things on your current team if it's not going so well or to even diagnose how your current team, if it is going well, could be even better uh, and, and be even more productive and effective. So that's where we're headed during our time. So a little review then, for those of you that weren't here on Monday during our time together, we're talking about a principle. And the main principle is this, that a team working together effectively can, in the long run, achieve more, much more than the work of a lone genius. Uh, that The research on teams and teamwork is clear that teams, when they work together well, uh, really do outperform lone geniuses. And the reality is none of us really do work alone today. We're all dependent on other people to get things done. Uh, even though we might often find ourselves in an office alone, we have, you know, you have students, you have other, other people that you're working with. There's, you know, faculty, there's administrators, uh, there's, you know, clients, vendors, you know, all kinds of different people that uh, they are working together with. And so it's important that we focus on those relationships, making them the best they could possibly be. So again, by way of review, on Monday, we talked about this model. We started off by saying that the results that we get uh, through our teams and our teamwork is nothing more, nothing less than the combination of our perception and our behavior. So we have certain perceptions that allow us to get great results from the teams that we're working with. Well, that leads us to act a certain way, and that gives us the results that we want. And our perceptions in order to be effective need to be based on certain principles. And so that's really where we're focusing is what are the principles that really lead to effective teams? And that causes us then to see the world and see our teams a certain way, and then to act a certain way as well. And one of the first principles that we talked about last time was the idea of trust, that really the foundation or the glue of teams really is trust. What we said last time is that there's a speed of trust, that if there's a low degree of trust on a team, if people are suspicious of one another, uh, they really aren't sure about other people's work quality, that's going to cause speed to go down and costs to go up. It's going to slow things down. You might need to micromanage people. There might be a lot of conflict. And ultimately, that's going to increase your cost, right? 
But if there's a high degree of trust, if there's a sense of, you, you know what other people value, you know what they like, you know what that's, that, what's important to them, you trust their character and you trust their competence, well, that causes the speed to go way up and the cost to go way down on teams. So we, we played a fun little game. You might remember that. And some of the lessons that came out of that game were that gossip kills trust, right? The more that we're talking behind other people's backs and talking about them, assuming negative things about them, that's going to create this lack of trust environment on our teams. That micromanaging wastes time. If we don't trust people's competence, it leads us to want to micromanage them and that ultimately wastes time. The blame cultures kill confidence and innovation. In our game, we had a double agent, right? You remember that? And the double agent, actually, there, which there wasn't one, but if you assume that there were double agents, people that were trying to maybe slow you down and not get the best work done, you start to blame other people. And what we need to do in order to have healthy and effective teams is assume a posture of trust and assume positive intentions and motivations by other people. Because when we start to blame people, when people make a mistake, that really does kill confidence and innovation. If we think negative, we find negative, we assume people are double agents. If we assume that they really aren't being productive, if we assume that they don't really have the best interests of the team at heart, we're going to find evidence for that probably. We want to assume positive intent for other people. Because like it says at the end, people don't come to work intending to do badly. Again, like I said, we play, played a fun little game that talked about that. Now, before we move on to the next section, I just wanted to see, uh, does anybody have any questions from our last time or any thoughts from our last time about team excellence, talking about you know, trust and talking about those perceptions? Any, anything you've been thinking about between Monday and now that you'd wanna, wanna share? I, I do have something. Yeah, please. Oh, my, I got, Go oh um, so I guess my only kind of thought is so I really enjoyed the game and everything like that. I knew there wasn't a double agent, but um, <laughs> you knew <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was all a part of your plan. But no, um, so I guess my only I, I feel like where I find it difficult, especially when having to work with teams, um, in really allowing myself to trust, um, someone was is if I don't know the like, let's say I've never worked with the person before, you know, um since there is no I guess baseline of I don't know how they work with teams I don't know much about the personality I don't know like what their goals things like that um, I do find it difficult sometimes to kind of just still trust a person because there there has been no relationship before that was kind of established so I don't know if that was something you're going to kind of get talk about today but that was just kind of something that 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 I was thinking about um because I feel like what we some of a lot of what we talked about last time is also um kind of trusting those that you already work with and you right. know and, and you put in your department and things like that so mm -hmm. those are just my thoughts yeah no I appreciate that Monique and I think we all kind of maybe I wasn't necessarily going to talk about that today but let me share my thoughts and be interested maybe hear what others have to say the way I see it is sort of like there's a spectrum I think there's some people where trust trusting others come supernaturally to them and they always that's always their lead foot right I think I'm that way I'm, I'm a bit of a golden retriever when it comes to that right you know it's like sir I'll, I'll trust you whoever you are um, and sometimes that's gotten me into trouble right I'm so trusting, sometimes I get a little gullible and people can't take advantage of that. And there's other people, and maybe this is you, Monique, there, there's kind of a sense of, it's like, okay, I'll trust you, but I, I also want to see you live up to that. You know, I want to see some evidence that you're, you're trustworthy, not that you, you don't mistrust people or, or others, but they, they do want to see a little bit more of that evidence. So I think we're all on that spectrum. I think the main thing that I was just trying to emphasize last time is even when you do have that new person come onto your team, you have, a, you have a choice. The choice is that you can kind of extend that benefit of the doubt to them, uh, or you can sort of hold that back, right? And maybe treat them with skepticism or doubt. And I'd say by and large, it's always the best policy to extend the benefit of the doubt to them, uh, to just assume they're trustworthy, assume uh, they're not trying to screw things or up or mess things up or anything like that. Um, but anytime that there's a gap in your knowledge, we don't fill that with suspicion, but we fill that with trust and belief in other people. That, that's kind of the main main idea. But I think, yeah, we are all kind of on sort of a, a continuum, of, if you will, of how maybe easy or hard that comes to us. I don't know. What do you think of that, Monique? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, because I, I am that kind of a person of, um, you know, and it probably has to do with a lot of personal experiences, whatever the case is, um, where 
if I don't know you, it's not necessarily that I distrust you. I just need a reason to trust you type of yeah. thing, you know? And so especially for projects that I'm extremely passionate about or I'm really invested in whatever the outcome or the anticipated outcome or goal is, I find it more difficult to kind of let go of certain things and allow to like blindly trust somebody that I don't quite have a relationship or know yet because I'm so invested in what the possible outcome can be. So, you know, that's where I kind of find myself struggling and in, in giving people the benefit of the doubt, I guess, is something that I can work a little bit more on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was just, again, those were just kind of my some of my thoughts. No, I think that's really good. And it goes back to even to just remembering that, you know, trust really is two sides of that coin, right? It's about character and competence. And so some of it is maybe a Again, giving people the benefit of the doubt, but to realize that, you know, let's say you're working on a project with somebody like for me, you wouldn't want me to be in charge of the finances of the team, right? That's just not in my wheelhouse. I'm, I'm not that I'm incompetent, but that's just not something I'm great at. And so you wouldn't necessarily trust me in that area, but I would hope if we were working together, you'd have a general trust, right? In my general abilities and the, what I can bring to the team and these sorts of things. So some of it can also be specific in terms of what's your task or what's your particular role it's good somebody else was going to say something was it was Kaylon or z i was going to but i put it in the chat i trust people until they give me a reason not to mm -hmm. and then Kaylon in the chat said something that really resonated with me she's pretty much the same but she's much less wary now than when she was younger and mm -hmm. I find the same thing. When I was a lot younger, uh, I did not trust people mm -hmm. as easily as I do now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why that is. Because you, you would, it, that seems counterintuitive. Yeah. Right. You uh -huh. would think that life's experiences would cause you to trust people less the older you get, but I find it's just the opposite. Uh huh. Interesting. Yeah. That's a great. That's a. It'd be really interesting to kind of dig a little bit deeper into that. Yeah, that is, that's really interesting. Yeah, and I think for all of us to think about, so on a team, you know, what is the impact of not trusting, right? So if we don't trust people, it goes back to that other slide, right? We start to micromanage people. Uh, we start to question their abilities. We start to question, um, you know, whether they care about the same things that we do, right? And those kinds of things. And, and ultimately, it just slows down the team. So the foundation of any team, there's got to be trust, right? I've got to know that you're doing the best you can, that you're you're working as, as hard as you can and, and making sure that you have as much character and competence as possible, right? And that's ultimately what it comes down to. We can only control ourselves. We can't control other people. And so I, I think ultimately, I'd like all of us to really think about, am I a person of high degree of character and high degree of competence? Am I trustworthy on my team? Because that's really where it starts. That's good. Well, let's, let's keep moving then. So the next thing we want to talk about, uh, the next key ingredient of a team really has to do with uh, agreeing on a common direction and vision. So we're going to talk about mission, vision, and values. So you've probably heard these terms before. Uh, so let me, let me ask you this. Um, actually, let me do it this way. Finish this phrase for me, okay? You can either unmute yourself or put something in the chat. Stop, drop, and... roll <laughs> there you go thank you stop drop and roll right fantastic uh let's see if you know this one duck cover and anybody know it's it's about this one's about earthquakes oh i was gonna say shoot so i guess it's wrong <laughs> no even yeah, you're never probably mind. Not, yeah. never mind <laughs> i love it i love it no in earthquakes duck cover and hold on so in a fire, you stop, drop, and roll. In an earthquake, you duck, cover, and you hold on. So we've got different phrases like that, right? That are just these memorable phrases to help us uh, know what to do in certain situations. Well, that's what your mission statement of an organization is. It's designed to be a simple statement of who you are and where you're going in your organization. It's designed to help everybody in the organization to be on the same page together, understanding where they're going. It's really all about why your organization exists. What is the point? What's the purpose of your organization? Uh, so let me ask you this. Why is it that most people really don't know their organization's mission statement? They really don't know what the ultimate purpose is. Any guesses as to why? Mm 
mission statement is usually too complicated. Yeah. Yeah, maybe a little too wordy, right? You know, you kind of think of like Charlie Brown. Have you ever seen the Charlie Brown cartoons with whenever there's an adult that's talking, it's always, you know, wah, 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 wah. And that's kind of what a lot of mission statements are. You know, they're just too wordy, using a lot of jargon and just not easy to remember. And so most people maybe hear them once or they're printed on some piece of paper and they never think about it again. So let me ask you this. Why is it important for team members to know the mission of the organization? What are your thoughts? Why, why would that be important for team members to know the, the purpose, right? The reason the organization exists. What's the benefit of that? So they're all on the same page. Like they all know like, like what is the goal in mind? What is our purpose? What are we here to do? So you're all on the same page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if they don't, right? You know, some person might think, oh, the mission is this. So somebody else thinks, no, this is what we're all about. And somebody else thinks it's something completely different. Well, they're going to be potentially doing things that are even at cross purposes with one another, right? And they might not even be helping each other out. It's great. Thanks, Monique. Yeah. Any other reasons? Why is it important for team members to know the mission of the organization? What do you think? You could even think an opposite. How does it hurt if we don't know the mission of the organization? If we don't really know what our, what our purpose is? We don't know them. How do we know what we're working for, I guess? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're working for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, we find that people that know the mission of the organization, they tend to be more willing to even take risks for that mission, right? Because if you know it, hopefully you really embrace it, you really like it. And that increases your level of engagement, increases your, your level of motivation to really make that happen. Uh, if, you, if you know the why, if you know the purpose, it draws from deep wells of motivation going in that are inside of you. Think of there's a, an old story that's told of uh, two people that were working and they're, they're building a wall of bricks. And you ask one person, what are you doing? And this person says, well, I, you know, I take a brick, I put some mortar on it, I put, put it on top of the other bricks, and this is what I do. I put one brick on top of another. You ask the other person, well, what are you doing? And this person says, oh, I'm building a cathedral that will allow people to connect with the divine two very different people. One has a sense of what the mission is. You know, why am I laying these bricks? Well, it's for a greater purpose, right? So the people that can connect with something greater than themselves. And that person, because they know the greater purpose, uh, their day-to-day -day work has uh, significant meaning to that particular person. And so that's one thing. If you know the why, if you know the purpose of your organization, it actually motivates you even more to want to do great work and to want to participate in whatever your organization is doing. So, uh, and what we found is again, study after study has found that people really do value this. People really do wanna connect with the mission of their, of their organization. Uh, you know, I, I think I mentioned before that I, I used to work for Disney, uh, was an entertainer, a performer in one of the parks here at Disneyland, actually up until just a couple of weeks ago. The mission of Disney is we create happiness. And isn't that great? Just simple, memorable. Right, but something that all cast members can really uh, rally around. The mission of Coke, I don't know if you've heard this, to refresh the world in mind, body, and spirit. Isn't that great? Again, simple, memorable, right? You wouldn't even know that they make sugared beverages, but this is the mission. This is what they're trying to do. Uh, Nordstrom, I don't know if you've ever shopped at Nordstrom, to give customers the most compelling shopping experience possible. That's their mission. Again, simple, memorable. If you've been in a Nordstrom, you know, you know that's generally true. And then finally, Ted, have you ever listened to TED Talks? Watch TED Talks. Does anybody know the mission of TED? Spread ideas. It's just simply to spread ideas. And they do that so well, don't they? And you can picture anybody that would work for these companies, it's really easy to rally around these missions. And it gives them clarity to know what they should do day in and day out. So what we're going to do during our time is we want to help you to connect with your mission statement. So the first question is, do any of you know the mission of Fresno City College? 
And I see some of you maybe already, you're typing furiously, right? What is that mission? All right, does anybody know it off the top of your head? I did a little research beforehand and I found it actually. Not the mission. Okay. Because I'll tell you, our mission is dictated by accreditation standards. So our okay. mission has to, in order to be accredited, has to include certain things. Oh, interesting. Do, yeah, but I do know our vision. And that's my why, to transform lives through education. Oh, I love it. There you go. So I just put in the chat. Let me put in the, uh, in the chat. This is probably, if Susie went there, maybe. Um, so I found the website where this is located. So I want you, everybody do this for me. Uh, click that link that's in the chat. And you can also do a Google search of it. I just did that. I just did Fresno City College Mission and Vision. And this page popped right up. So I'd love for everybody to click that link, navigate over to that page, and you'll see the mission statement. You know, as California's first community college, Fresno City College provides quality, innovative educational programs and support services directed toward the enhancement of student success, lifelong learning, and the economic, social, and cultural development of our students and region. That is a mouthful. And like you said, Susie, maybe there's certain things you just have to include, right, as a part of being accredited. And then the vision statement, let me post that in there. This is definitely way more memorable. And it sounds like, Susie, something you really connect with, right? As educational leaders in the community, Fresno City College faculty, staff, and students will engage in a partnership to transform lives through education. That's cool. So here's what I want to do is, <clears throat> So now that you know the mission statement and, and you see the vision statement, I want to give you some time to think about your contribution. So on your learner guide or your participant workbook, you see uh, the question, what is our mission statement and what's my contribution? I want to give you some time. I'd give you just a couple minutes to think through your role, think through your job. Okay, what do you do? And then on in your learner guide or on a sheet of paper, Jot some thoughts about how you contribute to that mission. So again, thinking about the bricklayers, right? That you know, one just saw themselves building bricks. The other person realized they were actually building a cathedral. What's the cathedral? And then what, what are your bricks, right? And so how does what you do day in, day out, how does it contribute to the lifelong learning and the economic, social, and cultural development of, stu of the students and the region? Or how does it contribute to engaging in partnership to transform lives through education? Does that make sense? So, so let me ask Monique, what, what's your role? Let me give you an example of this. So I'm a senior, my title is a senior program specialist. Okay. Um, and I work for the CalWORKs department on, on campus. Fantastic. Okay. All right. So I, I know nothing about what you do. So how do you connect what you do day in and day out? How does it contribute to that mission and that vision? Well, um, so like Susie, I, I don't, I didn't really know like the specific word for word in regards to what our mission is, but I didn't know what our mission is for our CalWORKs department. Mm -hmm. And I feel like they kind of go hand in hand. Um, and so the mission, it talks about, you know, um, providing a, a supportive services um, towards the success, student success. Um, and so that's what a lot of what we do here in the CalWORKs department. So we serve a specific population that comes here, but I make sure so our department runs like a whole machine. And so um, I kind of see myself as the mechanic of the machine at times. Right. So I'm not directly involved in only one aspect of our department. I'm involved in all aspects of our department. And so I make sure that the whole machine is running good so that if we're doing our job, then we're meeting the not only our mission, but the campus mission. Because if we're doing our job, then we're making sure that students are getting what they need. We're making sure that students are successful, um, whether it's campus resources they need or community resources that they may, may need. Um, and then we also help them with non-academic things because as we know, um, it's not always about academics. Sometimes they have other issues that are much more of a priority before they can focus on academics. So as long as I'm doing my job as a mechanic, then the machine is running well and we're able to get students to where they need to get to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's great. That's good. That's good. I'm going to pick on Susie. All right. So uh, tell us what, what's your connection to either this vision or the mission? How, how do you see what you do 
really fitting into making this a reality. My job, and not not the not the position that I hold right now, mm -hmm. in any of my jobs at, at uh, Fresno City College. And I know Monique can speak to this also. Is deeply personal. Mm -hmm. I, I say it quite frequently. Fresno City College changed my life, mm -hmm. and I came back to work at Fresno City College so that I could be part of that change for other people the job i currently hold now I'm, I'm far more disconnected from our students i work primarily with our employees mm -hmm. which is i love my job but it's sad that i don't get to work with students as closely as as monique does but i sometimes i, I struggle with that because i'm i'm doing a, a review of my program right now and they asked how does your program connect with the college's mission yeah, and yeah. i am struggling with that because what how am I, is what I'm doing having a positive impact on our students? Mm -hmm. And I think that by providing quality professional development to all of our employees, mm -hmm. uh, stuff like this, uh, yeah. pedagogy for faculty, you know, leadership training for management, that's just making us all better able to do our jobs, uh, equity training, making us more open and more vulnerable and, and more aware of the things that our students are going through and and uh, bringing out that empathy and, and that compassion and that kindness that we have for our students and so i think that's how right now i'm fulfilling my role mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's good and i think that that's the key right is a, is to really make that connection we, we used to call that uh, terminal versus relational thinking you know terminal is i put these programs together that's what i do relational thinking though is no I, I put these programs together to help our staff and our faculty be able to do their jobs better so that they can su serve the students and the community better that's going to lead to the economic social cultural development of our students and our region because you know, the better that they can do their jobs the more we're going to be able to serve our communities right and the more that we're going to be able to see lives transformed so if you can make those relate that relational connection if you connect see how all of these things are related uh, that makes it so much more significant. Kaylon, I'm, I'm going to pick on you if you're if you're back. Uh, what's your role, and then how do you see your role connecting to the greater mission and vision of Fresno City College? Are you there? Can you hear us? Sorry about that. Oh, um, first off, I'm going to say. Most mission, vision, value statements are too long, which is why most people don't know them. Yeah. Now, while I agree with the current one we have, it's still really long. That being said, my role as executive assistant to the vice president of student services, yeah. um, in this position, I don't have as much communication with students as I had in the past. I primarily see my role as helping the boss, my coworkers, her managers, those in our division, um, you know, with whatever the divisional needs are, and it can also be dealing with members of the public, members of other campuses, other divisions, and employees, regardless of whatever their their uh, classification uh, right. uh, is. And that's the wrong term. I'm just not on all six cylinders today. Totally fine. <laughs> um, I, it, I enjoy the little bit of communication that I have with students uh, because one of the things I've realized over time is, is students have changed over time. The college has changed over time. And, you know, I went to college 40 years ago plus, and um, I went to a community college and then transferred to a four-year university, but it's, things are different. I don't think students, and maybe it's because we've got more of a variety of students now who haven't had necessarily um, the educational background I might've had. So when I first started here 21 years ago, I expected students to know more. I thought, well, you know, you're either college ready or you're not, you know, mm -hmm. not every student is, is gonna get a college degree. Yeah. And I've really seen um, what a lot of our students go through. You know, they might not have that family support or education uh, might be appreciated, but they may not have the wherewithal, whether it's financial, uh, physical or whatever. Um, and I really like helping them with things that 
I might have considered basic. Okay, you get on the phone with somebody. Mm -hmm. The first thing you do, find out who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. Write it down, whether it's in your phone or on a piece of paper, somewhere where you're going to have it. Get their name. Get what office they're in. Get the phone number. Tell them your name, your ID number, your phone number. So if we get disconnected, we can call you back. Mm -hmm. um, tell us quickly what the situation is. Then we'll go through the nuts and bolts of it. Or, okay, um, boyfriend, don't have your girlfriend ask the questions for you because you're <laughs> going to be the one who has to deal with the situation. She's not always going to be around there. You know, I mean, <laughs> things like that. I like helping them see that they're capable and that they can do things. And yes, even though they're having struggles, we've got people on campus who can help them. And in the long run, it's going to be worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's a struggle for a lot of our students now. And, and, and you know, we've seen so much food insecurity and, and home insecurity now that we hadn't seen seven years ago, yeah. 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that puts a lot more stressors on our students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's and it's it seems it can be really easy to connect those things and helping out students in that way with that mission, that vision. Right. Because if you can do that, it really does help students be successful, even to uh, enhance the economic, social and cultural development of them and the region. Right. You know, if they can, yeah. you know, learn some of these basic skills and then get their education, that's going to just only that's going to raise the level of, you know, achievement and success really throughout the region. And we've got a pretty high poverty rate in our region and have had for a significant period of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think we all know that education is one of the best ways out of that poverty, right? For a lot yeah. of people and to yeah. create, to create opportunities for them. That's good. Good. So, the, so the key is, you know, to be really thinking about it, that we know the mission, like you said, Kayla, and yeah, the, you know, it could be super long. It might be hard to understand. That's why I do like that vision that you've got. And then to really think about how do I contribute? What is my role? Do I understand how what I do day to day really connects to that ultimate mission and where we're headed? Because the minute we stop understanding that, that's when it leads to burnout. The minute we stop understanding how what we do really connects to the greater mission and the greater purpose, then we're going to become way less motivated to do it. If we don't understand the why, if we don't understand that powerful force that draws us, we're not going to have the energy to really accomplish the things that we need to accomplish. And then you might want to think about what's your memorable connection? So one way to think about this is maybe you don't understand, maybe the mission statement is a little convoluted or something like that, but you could think of your own mission statement. You could think of your, your own memorable way of talking about and understanding what you do. I, I really liked Monique. I think you, you hit it there. What did you say? You're the mechanic? How did you put it? Yeah, I'm the, me the mechanic and my department and the people in it are basically the machine. I love it. So that's that's what I'm I'm talking about here is this idea. Of, can you think of a metaphor, think of something, a word or a phrase that really helps you uh, know your memorable contribution? I've been in a, in a workshop another time and somebody talk about uh, I'm the what did they say? I'm the I'm the person with the I got a can of water in one hand, a can of fertilizer in the other, and I make things grow. And I love that. What a great example, right? And so uh, the mechanic example, what, what is it for you? Is there a metaphor? Is there a way of thinking about your job that really helps you understand what your connection is and what your contribution is? So does, either I'll pick on uh, Susie and Kaylon. Does anything come to your mind when you think about that? Kind of what maybe would be a good metaphor or a good thought to think about what your contribution is? Yes. Let's hear yours. I'm the wizard behind the curtain. I love it. So good. That is so good. That's awesome. And you are providing brains, heart, and courage. What else? And courage. There you go, right? It's beautiful. That is so good. So again, it just helps you, right? In, the, in those moments, I'm sure, Monique, you probably have days where you're like, why am I doing this? What am I doing? Oh, I'm the mechanic. This is what I do. And this is why what I do is important. That yeah, that's really actually help. how I came up. So I used to, in my role, I used to work more closely with students. 
Um, and I used to work with students in helping them get like part-time jobs on campus or even off campus. And so there was one year um, that a student came and we had been struggling for a while um, because Spanish is their primary language and everything, but they were finally able to get a job and they were working. And so they came to visit me and they were just talking about thank you because this was the first Christmas in three years that they were going to be able to afford to do something like for their kids. And that really broke me because I was raised by a single mother. And so I know how hard the holidays are, especially when, you know, you're struggling just to put food on the table. And then you got to think about, you know, Christmas and presents and, you know, there's more than just one of us type of a thing. Um, and so I, I enjoyed working with students because every interaction with students reminded me of why I'm here and why I do what I do and, and all of that. And that's why I like going to the graduations and volunteering. And so um, we, we got a job developer. And so that portion of the work went to the job developer. So I stopped and I wasn't working with students one-on-one -on -one anymore. And I started to feel more of that burnout. And I started to feel like oh, I'm not as excited to go to work. I'm not as excited to do the work you know that's asked of me anymore because I didn't feel like that I, I wasn't seeing the reward I wasn't feeling kind of like that outcome because again I didn't have the same relationship with students and so um, I kind of had to remind myself that although I'm not working directly with students like my role is still important because if I don't do what I do then the counselors and the job developer and everybody else can't do what they do and then the students still don't get the same you know, there's, they don't get the services. They don't, they're not as successful. They're not, you know, with graduation, like all of that. So like, that's how I, I ended up putting it like, okay, you're the mechanic, you know, yeah. because if something breaks, you need to fix it. And if, you know, all of that. And so that's kind of what helped me that, although I don't, again, work with students as closely as I did before, um, just remind me that my job is still important. Because I think like Susie mentioned, especially when you're so invested, you know, in, in these students and kind of like the work here, when you're not seeing that interaction every day, it's kind of hard to forget it. You know, oh. it's, it's, you know, so I get what you're saying, Susie, as far as all that goes, it's because it is hard, you know, but there's a lot of like, I don't think our, our campus would be able to function without the uh, men and women in our building services, and they no. don't work with students as closely, or even, you know, with Kilan and with her job and making sure that the VP is, is you know, on, on point with what they need to do and, and people and her staff. And so I see now how all the little pieces are as important as a counselor that's meeting with the student face-to-face, -face, as a job developer that's meeting mm -hmm. with the student face-to-face, -face. Um, but we just don't feel it as much. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you make a great point. You think about the person that cleans the toilets on campus. It might be really hard for them to connect what they're doing to the mission of the school. But when you think about it, boy, if they aren't clean bathrooms and, you know, a student or faculty, they, we have to use the restroom, right? And so you go in and if, if it's not a, a welcoming environment, not a clean environment, you're not necessarily maybe going to be as motivated to be on campus or to be there, to be with the students, or, or it's not going to make you feel as valued as a member of the community and so boy that's really important right and so you can create an atmosphere by cleaning a bathroom that's going to help somebody maybe do their best work and really want to contribute to the community Kaylan, are you going to say something yeah on when i'm having a down day i feel like the albatross around the neck you know mm, uh -huh. <laughs> it's that old poem and, uh, you know, it's like it just hangs around or, or, or rather that I'm the sailor wearing the albatross because I have to tell people bad news, things I know they're not going to want to hear, but things that are necessary, things that have to be done or, or it's something that's the process and the protocol. And there's certain things by which we cannot deviate, even though we would love to. Yeah. However, all that being said, in terms of memorable connection, I had a student aide years ago, probably 15 years ago. And we were still very actively in um, uh, the war with Iraq. And he said, Kaylan, I hate my name. His first name was Osama. And he said, Osama is the bad. And I said, then you're Osama the good. I said, so here's what we could do. And about 10 years later, and you two gals would understand, uh, my co at the time uh, was Ernie Garcia. And I get this puzzled voice. He goes, uh, Kaylon, you have Osama from Baghdad on the line for you? And I laughed because I, I knew exactly who it was. And it was the student aide who'd called me back and he was telling me 
how working at City College had been so beneficial to him. He'd gone on, he'd gotten his degree in accounting. He was now working for the World Health Organization, helping feed families in mm. war-torn countries. Mm. That is the memorable connection to, you have so much that you have to tell people you know they don't want to hear. But then you get these wildly successful stories from people who never thought they had an opportunity or a chance. Yeah. And that is what makes all the other challenging days or moments worth it. It really is. Mm -hmm. mm. So good. Yeah, that's great. So here, I think the lesson for all of us is for our, ourselves in those days, when we feel demotivated. We feel like we don't really understand why we do what we do to remember those stories, right? To remember that metaphor. And then we're going to have people on our teams, people that we work with that are, that are demotivated, that maybe don't understand why they're doing what they're doing. And if we can help them make that connection, that's going to be real powerful for them as well. Uh, and that's where that, uh, that deep motivation is going to come from. Really good. Thanks, everybody. That was really good. So we've talked about mission. Now let's talk a little bit about vision. So we got the vision statement. Generally, a vision statement is a statement that talks about where we want to be by when. And it's kind of this grand dream uh, that organizations and teams have of what they want to accomplish by a certain time. So if the mission tells us why we exist, the vision is what are we shooting for? What's our goal? What's our dream? Where do we want to be by when? You know, so let me ask you, what's the benefit of having a clear vision of success as an individual or a work team? Why is that important to not simply know uh, why we exist, but to know where we're headed, to know what our goals are, to know what success looks like in a given year or a given month. Why is that important? What are your thoughts? If you've got no vision, you've got nothing to work for. And if you've got no plan, you're just going to flounder. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, Monique, accountability. Yeah. Talk a little bit more about that. I agree. Well, yeah. So, you know, um, I think oftentimes there are certain ideas that are presented that aren't necessarily bad ideas, but it's not necessarily in line with what the vision is. Mm -hmm. And so kind of like holding each other accountable, like, is this something that we should be spending resources and time on if it, it doesn't align with our mm -hmm. vision and mission? Or is it something that's best for either another department, another area or another time in general? So I feel like, you know, in that sense, accountability, just holding us to either the timeline or, you know, our specific purpose or whatever, whatever that goal is that we're working on. Yeah. Yeah. I find so many teams flounder because they really don't know what they're shooting for. They really don't know what the goal is that they're working, they're doing things, but they really don't know what they're working towards. The other thing that's often a problem is there's really isn't a finish line. Imagine being in a race and you didn't know if you were running a 5k, you didn't, you wouldn't know if it was a 10k, you don't know if it's a marathon, you have no idea when you're actually going to complete the race, how frustrating would that be? And so the vision is the end of the race. This is how we know when we're, we've accomplished that mission, what our, what our dream is. So I think of you know, John F. Kennedy. What did he say? What was his vision? Well, his vision was, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to earth. A very clear vision. Here's where we want to go by when. We want to put somebody on the moon and bring them back before the end of the 60s. And you know, 1969, the first, first person was on the moon. Neil Armstrong walked on the moon in 1969. I believe Kennedy's predecessor, Eisenhower, his vision for space exploration was simply, we want to be the world leader in space exploration. That's fine, but it doesn't give us this clear goal to shoot for. This And now we even have a term for it, right? The moonshot. What's your moonshot? What's your big, hairy, audacious goal that you're shooting for that you want to see accomplished? So the question that we need to ask ourselves is, what's your vision for success? And can you stay at it in terms of from X to Y by when? So thinking about your department, your area, my question would be, what's your moonshot? You know, what is your vision of success? What are you shooting for? Maybe it's a, you know, certain number of, of programs that you do, certain number of people trained, certain number of, you know, students, you know, sent into certain careers or different things like that. 
I'd be curious, uh, are there things like that when you, when you think about this idea of having a vision for success and some significant goals that you're shooting for? Uh, what are some things that come to mind? And it could be your department. It could be college-wide. Does anything come to mind? I think right now, um, enrollment. So enrollment has really decreased a lot for, I mean, across the board. Yeah. Um, but really making sure that we increase enrollment. And I think for us, you know, so much of our students kind of focus, they don't have the luxuries of being able to focus on the future because they're living day by day. Um, and so a lot of times um, students get trapped in the cycle of working jobs and not careers. And that's what keeps them in poverty. So really trying to focus on increasing enrollment and so that that way they can, you know, have careers rather than jobs that eventually lift the families all out of poverty. And then I think smaller goals with that is, you know, um, GPA, making sure that we're helping in increasing GPA, because if, you know, there's a higher GPA, it just shows that they're getting the resources and the needs and to be successful in their classes. And so um, I, I know that those are like kind of little benchmarks that we have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's great. And that is another way to think about vision is a sort of a benchmark. It's kind of like this picture of your desired future. How what are the indicators that we're accomplishing our mission? You know, what's our goal and how are we gonna get there? Yeah. Susie or Kaylon, any, uh, any thoughts that you have or what comes to your mind when you think about maybe an organizational vision or one for your department? When I just did this, like I said, I'm doing a review of my program and mine is uh, within four, within the next four years, I want to increase professional development so that 75% of our employees will participate in at least one professional development activity. So good. Offered by the college. Yeah. Good. Very clear, right? We, if I'm on your team, I know exactly what we're shooting for. I know exactly where we're going. That's super clear. And it's motivating. Like that's something that I would want to see happen if I was working with you. And I would want to be a part of that. Yeah, that, that really gives clarity. Kaylon, does anything come to mind for you in your area? Yeah, it would have been something different. Um, our division's a big division. Yeah. Oops. And um, we had, it's not even been a week, a, a, a death of one of our administrators this week. Oh my, okay. And it has uh, really ripped the staff up. Wow. And you know, it's hard for everybody to concentrate. And so we're now down a position. One of the people is going to have to be doing two administrative jobs and he hasn't been here for years. So I, I think for me, what I'm seeing is, as a smaller goal is, and that same department had two of the classified staff just promote. And so they're going to be gone at the end of this semester to other areas or other campuses. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other employees, you know, it, 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 it's iffy about that person are they going to be here are they not going to be here you know so that department in our division has been absolutely decimated mm. and um I, I think our goal because everybody's working on how do we we can't fix it but how do we make it palatable if you will mm -hmm. and by the end of this semester uh, my my supposition because we're still talking about it is to maybe have uh, somebody fill a position permanently. But we also have to have people filling the classified positions. And it's not just that, it's how do we do this and help the staff get through everything that's going on yeah. with a shift that's gonna be totally unexpected with a new person, a new personality who may or may not know the other parties involved. You know, just when we were hoping we'd have some kind of stability, you know, a couple of, people get some fabulous news and uh, that they're getting promoted, uh, but it means a, a loss on that end. The other one is, is, is we're lo losing uh, a beloved family member, if you will. Yeah. Um, and and it's, it's hard. It's been hard for people to concentrate. It's been hard for people to focus. It's been hard for us to forget what we're doing. And of course, all of these things are happening near the end of the semester and towards a hall, you know, so you have all the psychological aspects piled on top of the pragmatic day-to-day uh, -day functionings mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we in our division haven't been through something like this before yeah. so it's 
you know, we don't know what we're going to do really. We're trying to figure it out. We're kind of floundering. A lot of people are going to be on, but you know, I mean, it's all these things. Mm-hmm. And um, I tend not to be a particularly emotional person at work, you know, mm-hmm. at least in terms of what might be termed the softer emotions. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you see a division, it's not just the division, it's the campus, it's the community, you know, all of these things. It's hard to know where we're going and we're losing our college president who's going to become our chancellor. So there's mm-hmm. all of those things tied in with what's going on departmentally. Mm-hmm. Um, and we don't know what the new person's going to be like. Yeah. You know, so there's all these uncertainties as well, what are we going to do? Where are mm-hmm. we going? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think that's a great example, right? Of oftentimes how, how, what's the word I'm looking for? How I guess say how it can impact a team if there isn't a sense of like you said where are we going what are we doing what's the next step and sometimes that happens when maybe there is a new leader that's coming or you're in a state of transition and there really isn't you can't get that clarity yet and it's going to come later but and it needs how do you to do come it at sensitively. some point in time and yeah and how do you do it, it sensitively yeah. right it, it, yeah. I mean it's it, it's still so fresh with everybody. You know, and and we're having a hard time comprehending that this has really occurred. Right. You know, we see it in writing. Okay. We see the person hasn't been in the office. And this is someone who worked just down the hall from us. Right. Um, Hard hard times leaving the semester right now. Yeah, I would imagine. I would imagine. And, And that's okay. There is a, there is a sense of there's going to be seasons where it's not necessarily about the, the moonshot, right? You know, or like, what are these big goals? You know, maybe the big goal is we need to just be emotionally healthy at this point in time. You know, maybe the, the main goal is we need to celebrate, you know, people that have, have left us and, and honor their legacy and their memory. And, and that's great. That's a great goal, right? But we need something that's going to rally us together, something that's going to help us know where we're headed in the future. And, and that's what this is all about. So thanks for contributing, everybody. That was really good. Well, the last bit that I want to talk about in this little section, and we'll do this pretty quickly because I want to get into a fun little activity. So we've talked about mission. We've talked about vision. So the mission is the why. Why do you exist? The vision is the where are you going? That's the where. Uh, The values are the how. How do we do it? What are the things that are important to us? What are the things that are going to define how we work together? So what are the question I have is what are the values of your organization? I actually closed out that that website, I think, but uh, I think on the Fresno City College webpage, and now I lost it. Oh, here it is. The core values. So what I saw were growth, leadership, and success. Does that sound about right to you all? Kind of those three main values? I see Monique kind of nod in the head. All right. So as you think about those values of growth, leadership, and success, the question I have is, how do you live those out? So I'd love to hear maybe an example or two from each person. How do you live out those values in your job? The value of growth, the value of leadership, and the value of success. You know, so growth is about committed to sharing, exploring new ideas, collaboration, respect for diversity, promoting equity, professional development, leadership. Let me just I'll copy all these and stick these in the chat. Leadership is about, you know, being leaders who are committed to the community, dedicated to behaving ethically, committed to communication, good stewards of resources. And success is about championing excellence, quality, collaboration, or quality, celebrating individual differences, and providing a positive and supportive environment for all. So I'd be curious, just I just put those in the chat. So would love to hear a couple of examples of maybe what do you do? How do you live those things out? You know, what's your green light? What tells you that you're going in the right direction with living out these values? So I, I want to go first. Yeah. Um, and then if we're talking specifically about these um, under success, as you mentioned, it says celebrating individual differences. Um, and that's something that we've tried highlighting a lot in the office that I work in. Um, one of the things I love about it is we're such a diverse office, mm. so much diversity here. And so um, one thing that we we started to do is um, there's because we're so diverse, there are other people, a lot of staff here that speak another language other than English, yeah. um, whether it be Hmong, Spanish, Punjabi, China, uh, Mandarin, whatever the case is. And so what we started to do is highlight that 
as well so that when if student doesn't like that the English isn't their primary language um, then they know that there's someone in the office that speaks their native tongue and then they're able to make appointments with them mm. and then we make sure that um, we like especially our front office they know which counselors speak which languages so that if we have a student in and the student you know is struggling with English and, pri and Spanish as their primary language then they know that they're going to set an appointment with Susana who is Spanish speaking and can provide those services in their language. Mm. And so this makes sure that the students are really receiving the information and that they know and that they're comfortable to ask questions and that they feel as if they belong here um, and stuff like that, which then helps in their success mm. and, and making sure that not only do they, that they, you know, they're successful in their classes but that they actually get to the finish line because there's just too many students who come onto campus and just don't feel welcome enough here and that they leave you know and coming from personal experience I mean I speak English and I speak English well so me feeling a sense that I belonged was something completely different that looked different to me and mm. so whether it's the language that you speak it's the communities that you come from or challenges that you've embraced or that you've had to endure um, just making sure that we provide that space for them so that they know that again that they belong on this campus. Well, that even sounds like you're hitting a couple of these too. So you talked about success, that's celebrating individual differences, but I also see that in the growth, right? That respect for diversity, promoting equity, that what you're doing there really does go in line with that value of growth as well. Yeah. Good. Well, let me, let me ask you all this. So uh, we got the green light. So this is what you do, what you're doing to promote these values. What do you, let's think about the stop sign. What are some things that maybe are going on that aren't in line with these values? Is there anything that you feel like this needs to be stopped because this really isn't in line with these values of growth and leadership and success? Can you think of any examples? Um, I think that there have been a lot of decisions made, kind of far sweeping decisions from uh, those higher up the food chain than we are, mm -hmm. which affect us where it might have been less onerous if they had chosen to include classified staff mm. who deal with the students on a day-to-day -day basis to say, I understand why you're thinking this might be a way to do it, but could we possibly add this? Or could you add this person into the mix? Because they can give you insight that isn't theoretical, but is actual and practical and, and daily lived. Um, especially since the, the, you know, we're now in the COVID era and we tend to get some proclamations and things coming either from the district or the campus level that it's, uh, this really might have done better had it been better thought out or discussed with folks or uh, practiced it on a trial run um, before these things were put out as here's what we're doing kids. And maybe some of these things could even be seen as going against, I'm looking at that growth value, committed to sharing and exploring new ideas through collaboration. Right? Yeah, so it, it, it's it, like a collaboration. Well, and you think of it, we really didn't collaborate, you know, maybe on yeah. some of those things or, um, you know, we're leadership, we're committed to open communication. And I get you can't be open about everything. There's some right. proprietary right. things, but, you know, as much as possible. Good. Yeah, Monique or, or Susie, any examples you think of and maybe things that you know you've seen or others have seen or that do that really don't contribute to these values or in what ways might people not live them out huh. i think people and i say people in general because um your attitude your belief about students um and expectation i think does more damage than you know i, I just feel like there are certain people that are made for this work and there are certain people who are not and if you're here for just a paycheck and not the actual students and the outcome and stuff like that then you shouldn't be working here at all mm. I think that those are the biggest like red lights is because sometimes that you know just being here for a paycheck or because this is a stepping stone or because you know that's going to look great on your resume whatever leads to what Kalan was talking about and sometimes um, sometimes poor decision making um, yeah. bad leadership um, and all these other obstacles later on down the road. So that's why I just let, said people in general <laughs> yeah. is 
because the young people are the problem. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting you mention this because uh, oftentimes when you're doing exit interviews with people, people that are leaving their jobs, one of the big reasons people leave jobs is because the, the leaders in the organization or the other people they're working with, they don't see them living up to the values that are stated in the organization. And so they see that disconnect and they think, well, why should I stick around here? These people really don't believe that. The other reason people often leave jobs is because they realize they don't want to live up to the values of the organization. I spent 26 years of my career with this global nonprofit organization, and that's kind of where I got to. I got to a point where, you know, I had spent about you know, 20, 25 years loving the values of the organization, really embracing them. But I've kind of got to a point where my values kind of shifted and I wanted something different. And that really wasn't what was at my core anymore. And so I know for me, that was time to leave. I, you know, I didn't want to have the organization change their values. That wasn't, I knew that wasn't going to happen. And so for me, it was just time to try to find a different way to live out what I wanted to live out. So that's another way that values can be really helpful is to kind of make you help you figure out, is this the best fit for me? Is this really what I want to be a part of? So I think all of us though need to think about, A, are we communicating the values well? And then B, are we living out those values? And is there anything that we either need to start doing in order to live out these values better or stop doing in order to live out these values better? So certainly some things to consider moving forward. <clears throat> All right, I wanna get to this last part. This will be kind of a fun little activity that we're gonna do. So one of the, the fruit of team excellence really is synergy. And synergy, you probably heard that term before, just means that the collective effort is going to produce way more than every individual working all by themselves. If we can come together, we can actually produce way more than we could if we were just working all alone. So we wanna do a little activity to kind of underscore the importance of working together on teams. And the activity is called the Lost at Sea activity. So this is where you're definitely gonna want your facilitator guide or that notebook, um, I'm sorry, that workbook to be able to reference, okay, because it has the directions in there. I'm just pulling it up myself here. So you'll find that on page, looks like page nine. All right, so here's the scenario, all right? So you all, the three of you have chartered a yacht. How fun is that, right? But sadly, you ran into a storm, <clears throat> And that yacht has run aground on this deserted island somewhere in the South Pacific. <clears throat> Your best guess is that you're maybe about a thousand miles, maybe more from the closest land, closest civilization. Uh, you, you're stuck. Uh, and the captain and the first mate perished in the accident. So it's just the three of you. The three of you are the only survivors of this particular yachting accident and you're stranded in the middle of the South Pacific. On page, oh, no, on page 10 actually is the, the scenario here. So let me, let me just read that. You and your team have chartered a yacht. None of you has any previous sailing experience, but you have a skipper and a two-person crew. As you sail through the Pacific, a fire breaks out and it destroys much of the yacht and its contents. The yacht is slowly sinking. Your location is unclear because the vital navigational equipment is non-functioning. The radio equipment also has been damaged and doesn't work. You're in trouble. Your best estimate is that you're about a thousand miles southwest of the nearest land. And the yacht skipper and crew all perished in the fire. So here's the deal. You have a rubber raft, which holds every member of your team, all three of you, some matches and five $1 bills. You've got the raft, matches, and five $1 bills. In addition, you also have the 15 items found in the chart within your participant guide. So on the next page of your participant guide has 15 items. Your task is to rank the 15 items in order of their importance to your group's survival. Hold on, okay, sorry, I just wanna go back here. In order of your group's survival. So what you're gonna do is you wanna place the number all right, so using the chart, you're gonna place the number first working individually for where you would rank that particular item, okay? So one to 15, where do you think it is? So what's the most important item? You give that a number one, next most important is number two, next three, all the way down to the least important item will be number 15. That'll be the least important item. So on page 11 of your participant guide, I wanna have you, first of all, rank them individually. All right, so just take some time individually and using uh, 
page 11 of your participant guide, I'm going to give you like three, four minutes to just do an individual ranking. What are the items that are most important to your survival in rank order of one to 15? All right, before I, I put the three, four minutes on the clock, any questions about this? Okay, all right. So what you're gonna do first is you're gonna rank them individually, and then I'm gonna have you discuss it as a group, and then as a group, you're gonna agree on the ranking as a group, okay? So first of all, I'll do it individually. I'll put like two, three minutes on the clock, but just let me know when you're done with your ranking, and then we can move on to the group portion of it. There's a one case of army C rations. What is that? Uh, thank you for asking Ooh. that question. No, uh, nobody can answer that. All right. So you may oh. not know what everything is. That's okay. Just give it your best guess. Yeah. You when when you get into your group, then you can discuss if you know what those things are. But uh, but right now, we'll we'll just have you g give it your best guess. So what I'm hearing is you're not going to tell me. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you don't know what an item is. Just give it your best guess, and then in the group, then you can talk about that. What's sometimes it's helpful maybe to start with the you know the, what do you think of the top three, what do you think of the bottom three, and then fill in the rest. That sometimes makes it go a little faster. All right, Monique is done. Thank you very much. Susie and Kaylon, just let, let us know when you're done. Susie's done. Kaylon, how about you? Close well, enough for government work. I'll finish it up. Okay, I, let me, I'll give you 10, 10 more <laughs> seconds. 10 more seconds. Just maybe, maybe do a quick guess. 10 more seconds. <laughs> Okay, here's what I'm gonna do now. Now I'm gonna give you some time. It normally I give you about 15 minutes, but we'll see. You might be able to, a smaller group, you might be able to get done with this faster, but I'm gonna have you work as a group now. And as a group, you decide on what the rankings are. And so this is what the T column is for, all right? So in the T, now you decide as a team where you would rank them. So here's some rules that you see on the screen. So avoid arguing for your own rankings. You know, present your position as lucidly, as logically as possible. But listen to other members' reactions, consider them carefully before you press your point, okay? Don't assume that someone must win, someone must lose when your discussion reaches a stalemate. Look for the, maybe the next most acceptable alternative to all parties, right? Don't feel like you've got to argue for this, but see what you can agree on. Don't change your mind simply to avoid an argument and conflict and reach harmony and agreement. Number four, you want to avoid maybe some conflict-reducing techniques like majority vote, average coin flips, and bargaining. Try to really discuss things and see if you can come to an agreement. And then remember number five, differences of opinion are natural and expected. Seek them out, Learn, listen to one another during this experience. All right, so your job then, uh, it says now working as a team using the guidelines we discussed, come up with a team ranking. It says 15 minutes, but I think you should be able to do this a little bit faster. So let, let's see how quickly you can get this done. And then record the team's ranking in the column mark T, okay? All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm just gonna be a fly on the wall, listening in. But uh, now you all can can discuss how you want to rank these things. So maybe we, we can. Eat? 
Sorry, how about we each give our top three? Oh, yeah. And, and before you do this, let me just say, if you've done an activity like this before, or even done this activity for, play along as though you haven't. Okay, pretend you haven't done it. Okay, go so ahead. do you, any of you guys know what the army C thing is, just in case I change my mind and rate it higher? It's dehydrated food. Oh, that's what I assumed. So I put it in my top five because I was like, if it's coming from the army, maybe it's useful. So, <laughs> okay. So like Susie, you want to share your top three first? The, the maps, shark repellent, and fishing kit. I put the water um, maps and the mirror. And I put number one, water, number two, the sea rats, and number three, the plastic tarp. And the reason I put the tarp is because plastic is a protector, but it can also help keep warmth in. Not a lot, maybe, but at least something. Yeah, so the mirror may not make sense, but the reason I put the mirror is because you can use it like with the sun to reflect light. So if you see like another ship or someone are trying to like, basically since you're in the middle of the ocean, so get some type of clue that you're there type of a thing. Yeah, but that was I, my number four. <laughs> okay, because I was going to say that, be like, why did you put the mirror out there? But I was my number three, so that's anyway. That's but really I did put the water as number one. To me. <laughs> I did put the water as number one too as well and it's only because you can't drink just ocean water as much as one would hate it one can in dire circumstances drink yeah here and bleh. yeah but i mean That's water disgusting. was in my top five but i'm totally fine with putting it as number one because you're okay. right okay so we're all agreed on number one is the water okay yeah, yeah. do you guys want to say all agree on number two the maps because i think we all said maps i think as well do any of us read maps? I don't read, read map. maps. Can you? Can, mm -hmm. can you read an Oce o ocean? Oh, crap. The water maps, like the oceans, because ocean maps are different than land maps. I don't know how to read either one very well. I don't know how to read water ones at all. So, you know, I guess I really didn't think about it. Not today. Not today. <laughs> so maybe it's not as important if you can't read a map, you know? Because I can't read an ocean interestingly, map. Interestingly, I've had sex sent down as 15. Because so I have no I. idea. Even if I had one, I wouldn't know how to use it. So therefore, it'd be important to me. Sextant? Yeah. yeah. I put number 15 for that as well. So did I. Yay. Okay. So then we agree. Yeah, number so number maybe 15. maps aren't as uh, important as we think if, if we can't read them, right? If we knew how to use them, that'd be different, but not one of us does. <laughs> okay. Makes sense. So then who, okay, what was your guys' three? So my see to see what could be our two because my three was the mirror but um I think you, some I think of you guys had better definitely options it has to be in there yeah you have water right you can't go you're gonna die without water what i don't know how long it is you can go three days without food so i think food's really important and what was it the, oh the mirror yeah i think those three are probably the top three really the the water the sea rats and the mirror, because again, mirrors are reflective. And even if we're a thousand miles out and they've got a plane flying overhead, if we get, you know, you kind of flicker it as a, uh, uh, um, oh, it's one of those survival things. You, you flicker it because it, it can reflect. What I don't know is with all the reflection of the water, would they see a little handheld mirror reflected? That's what I don't know. I think so. I, I think so, because they reflect differently. Okay. You How know. about you, Susie? So yeah, I, th I think the mirror definitely, but I think tarp has to be in that top five. So what if you put tarp, tarp as, so what did we want as tarp number two? So I'm thinking, you what want, do you need for survival? You need water, you need food, you need shelter. Right. So then number two can be the food, dehydrated food. Right. And then the number three can be, yeah, then number three can be the, 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 the tarp. plastic. The tarp, yeah. yes. Okay. Number three, yeah, two. So then number three. So are you guys okay with putting number 14 as the two boxes of Hershey bars? Or is that I'm not a chocolate fan? That's why I was like, this isn't important to me because you know, but you know, if chocolate's gonna keep your sanity while we try to get rescued here, then maybe. 
I had it kind of middle of the pack because, well, it's they're high energy but low yes. value calories. Yeah, I think that would be like something we save for when we really need it, right? We we can eat the yeah. rations first, but yeah. I, I put the gallons of gas and oil way down because if the so yacht's I, sinking and the raft, we don't, it doesn't have any notion of what, if the raft has a, a motor. And if we're a thousand miles out, two gallons isn't going to get us anywhere. Not really. Yeah. Do you want to put that as a We could start a fire if we saw a passing boat and the mirror didn't work reflecting to catch their attention. We could. With the matches. We don't have matches. I thought we do have matches. You do. That's not part of that list. You do have matches. matches. Oh, Oh, that's what the friendly for the ocean. That's what the one dollar bills are, though. Well, I'm not sure I'd care so much about environment friendly if it's going to mean I die without it. I'm sorry. I normally am pretty environmentally friendly, but then I'm going. "Mm, I think I'm going to be. I had the gas. It was second from the top of mine too. Okay. So and the rum, the rum. does the same thing, right? I think even less dangerous. You can light rum on fire. Yes, and the other thing too, uh, rum is uh, alcohol, which can serve as a disinfectant if there's an injury or something. Say we use the fishing line and somebody, you know, I don't know, hooks their hand. Rum is a disinfectant, and it's also theoretically to help with cold. But I think that fishing kit should be and is pretty important. So I had yeah. fishing kit as number four. What did I have as four? Oh, I had the mirror as four. What did we have? What were our first three? We've got- So number one water. is water. Number two okay. is the food, the dry, dry, right. dehydrated food. And then number three is the shelter. It's the shelter. Yeah, yeah so I'm maybe since we have the, the, hydra- the dehydrated food, maybe we can put number four as a shaving mirror so that we have something. And then a fishing kit, number five, just in case we run out of- Because obviously uh, we hope to get rescued before- we go yeah. to our sea rations. I mean, a case of sea rations is going to last you a bit. Okay, so then maybe the fishing kit isn't as important then because you have food. And... Keep a fishing kit because you don't, I mean, you, you, you could hook fish. You might be able to hook even, yeah, you know, what's a plank, not plankton. What's the green stuff? Sea, we actually, is sea Seaweed. closer to the land? Kelp, kelp or kelp, something. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was thinking. Okay, try to finish, try to get like four more minutes. Try to finish up. Oh, okay. Four. So what do we want as number four? <laughs> okay. I wouldn't put the radio in because I don't know how to use one of those uh, uh, radios. So it's Would a small AMF radio. radio in? Yeah. Do we have the batteries? Do we know if it's functioning? Yeah. And then if it's out yeah, there in the, the water. Mirror. Okay. So we have the mirrors for. I'm okay, okay with that. So Are you okay with four. that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then number five. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Did we say the fishing thing or the rum? Well, let me see. So fishing was five, yeah. We can do that then. Are you okay with that? I'm good with that. Five. Okay. So we've got five. Okay. And then and then got. What did y'all have as like a number five or six or five and six, five? I had the fishing uh kit. And I still kept the chocolate because it's still some form of, of, of food source, but it's also got the, the sugar for the flagging energy. See, I'm assuming we wouldn't get saved within a couple of days. <laughs> I was taught to You're- think worst case scenario. My father was in Pearl Harbor at World War II and a ship got bombed. So I have a slightly different perspective on some things. This is a triggering for you, Kaylon. It is. A tr- <laughs> it, it is a, believe me, I was taught survival techniques at a very young age. <laughs> But I'm no sailor, and he was. Yeah, see, my survival techniques are different than being stranded in an ocean. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how to swim. <laughs> which, wait, okay, which brings me to the floating seat cushion. How good a swimmer is you two, ladies? Um, yeah, so it's just a seat cushion. So I added more towards the bottom because I didn't more know what, yeah, what value a simple seat cushion would be able to bring. Um, oh, good point. Yeah. Uh, type of thing. Um, so do we want to put like the rum as number six? Because it is like a disinfectant. I'm fine with that. I feel like if you're out there, you need at least a shot of something. 
So number yeah. six. So that's okay. six. And then um anybody know how to use shark repellent? Because it doesn't say if it's like a spear. Oh, I wouldn't know that I'd want to spear well, something. So uh, shark repellent for me was number eight. And the reason for that is because if you're out there, one is I don't know. So sharks don't kill as much people as people think unless they're hungry and it's really like food, you know? Um, but I mean, we're at number seven. So maybe now by this point, we would need a little shark repellent just so that they're not trying to eat us if they're hungry. Well, we are. I look, I look juicy. Out. I probably look juicy to a shark. <laughs> yes. You got that red, red shirt on too. Yeah. Easy, easy snack. Yeah. <laughs> that seven, Monique. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. So the red seven right now. Okay. okay. So are you guys okay with number seven? I am. How about you, Suze? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay. okay. So then for eight, we've got either. What was, oh. Uh, uh, you know, I think the rope is kind of in the middle because with ropes, depending if you get a seat, you know, if there's a seagull, you might try to rope it. I don't know, or we might try to use it to, to grab onto something. It doesn't say that there's nothing else out in the ocean. True. Or, 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 or to, to, to whack something if it's trying to get to us. I don't know, but we've already got the shark repellent, don't we? Yeah. Okay. The rope is just a useful thing to have. Okay. So we're going to have rope is eight. Okay. I'm okay with that. Okay. I had a little. So then we're at number nine and we still have the mosquitoes. We have the map. We have the floating cushion, the oil gas mixture, a radio, and a box of Hershey's. I two boxes of Hershey's, my dear. Two boxes of Hershey's. Yes. Excuse me. Yes. <laughs> right. So then because Hershey's, you got, it, it seems to be more important to you all. He made valid points as far as the energy goes and all of that. Do we want to put the two boxes of Hershey's as number nine? I'm good with that. How about you, Susie? Okay. Okay. So now we're on 10. So what do we got left? The map, which none of us can read, the floating cushion, the oil, mm -hmm. water, and the radio. Yeah. And then it, so maybe then the oil gas mixture, like as Susie said, set it on fire. I mean, poor fishes, yes, but yes. if the mirror doesn't work and you know, I just hope that we then don't catch on fire if we set water close to us on fire. There's going to be plenty of water near us. We could, we could set the mosquito netting on top of the floating seat cushion, tied to the rope, set the mosquito netting on fire and float it out from the raft. You clever puss you. I'm, so, I'm good with that. So then they kind of all work together, right? So for ranking them, um, 10, 11, 12, which do we think is the most important? Plus, it's going to be cold out there. Try to finish up in the next last. minute. Next one okay. more minute. So then what if number 10 is a mosquito netting? Because I feel like okay. it can serve more purpose. And then we can choose to set something else on fire. So then we can do the gas and oil mixture at number 11. And then number 12 will be the seat cushion. And then we've got the radio as 13 then. So 10, 11, hold on, 12, 13. So then we're, we, we have left is the maps and the radio. The sextant. That's already been 15. The sextant, yeah, that's already going to be. Oh, you know, the maps could also serve as another source to set fire to. If Burn we don't fire know how to, to use it. Yeah. So then we can do the maps as 13 and then the AM, FM radio as 14. Okay. I'm good. Beautiful. 14 and 14. Nice okay. work. Nice yeah. work. Okay. Oops. Good job. Good job, everybody. So the next step in this then is to find out what the experts say. So oh. that's what the E column is all about. So apparently the Coast Guard has studied this. They figured out what's the most important. So I'm going to tell you what the experts say. And so that's what the E column is all about. All right. So let me just show you and then feel free to write these in if you want to. Okay, so they would say the least, number 15 is the sextant. 
which is this ancient way of like navigating in the sea and honestly without tables and a chronometer it's useless so it's just nothing it's a, it's a glorified paperweight at this point so that's number 15. 14 is the mosquito netting though i thought you got some good uh, good arguments for that there's no mosquitoes in the mid pacific ocean and you won't catch any fish with it either if you were thinking about doing that i don't know if, hopefully you can read those i know it's super small number 13 would be the maps they're worthless without navigational equipment. It doesn't matter where you are, but where the rescuers are. So they, they really don't do you any good. That's, that's number 13. Number 12 is the radio, that AM, FM radio. No use without a transmitter, and you'd be too far away to get any radio stations. Number 11 is the rum. It actually contains 80% alcohol, which could be used as an antiseptic, as you all said, but little use for anything else. It actually dehydrates you if you drink it, so you really don't want to be drinking it at all. Number 10 is the shark repellent. Like you said, in case there are some sharks, then that might be kind of valuable. Number nine is that floating seat cushion. It could be a life preserver if somebody fell overboard. Number eight is the nylon rope. Could be used to lash people and equipment together to prevent them from being lost. Seven is the fishing kit. You might need that for food. Eight, six is the chocolate. Uh, a little bit more important than the fishing equipment because you might not catch any fish. The chocolate is a done deal, even though you may not like chocolate. <laughs> it is food. Plastic tarp is number five. Can be used to collect rainwater, provide some shelter. Number four are those sea rations for food. Three is the water. Two is the gallon of Goyle gas mixture. This is for signaling, as some of you said. The liquid can float on the water. You can use the matches uh, and the dollar bills to light that. Not great for the environment, but it might save your life. And then number one is that shaving mirror that's critical for signaling. Okay, now I know we've only got a little bit of time left here, but here's the, the next step is now to do a little math. And you wanna find out what's the difference between your individual ranking and the expert ranking, and then the difference between your team ranking and the expert ranking. So I'll do the team ranking and the expert. So I was writing those things down. So for you all, if you would just figure out the difference between your individual ranking and the expert, and then you'll come up with a whole number. So let's say, you know, this, the expert said the sextant was 15. Let's say you said that was number one. The difference is 14. All right, so just 14 is the number. All right, so come up with all of those differences between your individual ranking and the experts. And then, so you're gonna come up with 15 numbers, then add those 15 numbers together, and then you're gonna come up with a final number. All right, so I'm gonna do the other one. So I'll do the expert and the team, I'll take care of that. You just do the math on the individual versus the expert, okay? Nice. So I have your team score. I know as a team, we didn't do too bad. You did great. Your, your total score as a team was 40. So that was kind of the difference between the expert and the team. Yeah. I was going and there are some that are, we ranked the same and then there's some that weren't too much off. Yeah, yeah. your sextant, the map was the same. The nylon rope was the same, and then a bunch. Yeah, the thing you got the furthest away was the oil and gas mixture. Yeah, yeah. And then the rum was the other one, but otherwise, yep. really close. Listen, as a Latina, we're still going to rank that in the top. You know I get it. I... <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So how did you do as individuals? Did, did you come up with your, your whole number for indiv individuals? What was it for you, Monique? 56. 56. Susie? Not there yet. All right. And I didn't finish mine before we started. Okay. All right. So we're taking the expert's rank and subtracting our rank. Exactly. Right. So if you said the sextant was one, they said it was 15. It's just a difference of 14. Yeah. So, you know, I was actually surprised that I got a big number because for the most part, they're small. 
like the difference was like three, two, four, a lot of twos, ones. But then I had only the three biggest ones where, let me see, the difference was 11, nine, and seven. Mm -hmm. As far as points wise, and the rest were like smaller numbers, but I got 56. Susie, do you have a number yet? No. Okay, right. Am, am I supposed to have negative numbers? No, everything's a whole number. Yeah, there's no no negative numbers here. Yeah, you're just coming up with all, all whole numbers. Yeah, no matter, you know, what your ranking was versus the expert. Well, as you're figuring that out, so at least with Monique, uh, your the team ranking was better than the individual. And in this exercise, I 90, see your point. 96% of the time, the team outperforms the individual. Isn't that interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So- so real quick, again, I know we're over time. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. But if that's the case, if 96% of the time teams outscore individuals in this activity, what, is this, what does that tell us about the importance of teams and teamwork? What are, what are a couple, maybe a couple lessons we can draw out? Well, I think you started off with it, that we're able to accomplish more as a team than as a solo genius type of a thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I ended, you know, I ended okay. up with 63. 63 for same deal. All right. So as, as a group, you got 40. And then, you know, the group did better than both both you would have done individually alone. So isn't that fascinating, right? It just kind of underscores the power of groups and teams working together and that you could all share ideas. And yeah, maybe there was some conflict, there was some differences, but as you kind of work through those things, you came up with a much better solution than you did working as individuals. So yeah. the, I think the lesson that we can all draw is just of the power of teamwork and that synergy that comes from working together. Now there's challenges, there's difficulties, as we don't necessarily always see eye to eye, but that's what makes us better ultimately. So again, I want to be respectful of your time. So here, here's what we've talked about, right? That our perception and behavior leads to the results that we get. There's certain perceptions that are going to cause us to behave a certain way on teams that will get us great results. And the main principles of perception really is that trust is the glue, that we need to be clear on our mission, our vision, and our values, where we're going, what we're trying to accomplish, how we're going to accomplish it, and that the result of that is synergy. So one way to think about it is trust is the root of any team. You've got to have trust. If you don't have trust in that team, then it's not going to be as productive as it can be. Mission, vision, and values are the vital branches, and synergy is the fruit. As teams come together, they actually can accomplish more than people working individually. So that's all I've got. Again, I want to be respectful of your time. Hopefully this has been helpful for you all to consider your own participation on teams. And you can use this as a way to diagnose the teams that you're on and how they're doing. If you've got problems, think about, first of all, is it a trust issue? Do we need to do things to increase trust in our team? Maybe people don't really understand where we're going or what we're all about or how we're going to do the things that we're doing. And so you need to clarify your mission, your vision, and your values. And then maybe people don't really value teams and teamwork, and they need to understand the importance of a team and the synergy that a team really does bring. So it can be a really a great way to diagnose any problems that you might experience on your teams. So let me just say, I'm happy to stick around if anybody else wants to talk or chat more, but like I said, want to be respectful of your time. Uh, thanks so much. It's honestly been an honor and a pleasure to partner with you all. Susie, thanks so much for putting all of these things together. Uh, feel free to reach out if you've got other questions or thoughts, but otherwise, again, thanks so much for this opportunity. Thank, thank you, too. Thanks, Monique and Kaylon. It was thank a you. lot of fun. Thank you yeah. all. Bye. Thank you all. I love the discussion. Appreciate it. Bye. Have a great day.